Sakaima Chache is a Zimbabwean Scottish visual artist and curator based in Glasgow. Her work is a deep interrogation into the notion of self in which photography plays a crucial role in supporting an exploration of the historical and cultural imaginary. She is interested in the relationship between spirituality, dreaming, and the role of the artist in disseminating symbolic imagery to provide a space for healing against contexts of colonialism and loss. Sakai is currently at work on an ongoing series of projects collectively titled The Divine Sky, the 12 parts of which refer to the 12 stages in the indigo dying process. Christopher Marshall, who you just met, is a peatland scientist at North Highland College, University of the Highlands and Islands. His re research focuses on examining landscape scale peatland processes in the present and geological past to understand the controls on peatland resilience to future climate change. Chris is currently contributing to a Leverhulme Leadership Award examining how satellite radar can be used to assess future peatland resilience and the NERC funded fire blanket project assessing the impact of large fires in the flow country in 2019. So now without further ado, I am delighted to hand over the spotlight to Sakai and Chris. Hi. Hi. <laughs> thanks for the introduction, that was lovely. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, it's nice to see you again, Chris, and to yeah. be able to chat again. We had a really good uh, conversation last week, and uh, hopefully we won't just be repeating everything we said, but um, <laughs> I think this is a great opportunity yeah. to sort of, um, kind of take from what you were talking about in terms of the work that you were doing, um, to talk about bog breathing and, I guess, a, a bit more of a kind of poetic way in relation to, to like, the way that I work and the way that um, we spoke before as just thinking about the notion of bog breathing as like something that um, bridges the world with the worlds of sort of uh, science and the and the fantastical or the magical and I wondered if you could speak a little bit on that <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's uh it's quite interesting in the kind of bog breathing for a long time wasn't really considered it was kind of like an interesting sort of aside in peatland science so it's kind of one of those things where it didn't really have it, it wasn't notionally known as having a use <laughs> I guess it was kind of it was something that people observed so they kind of there was like folklore about not being able to see a church spire over the horizon in certain times of the year and then being able to see it other times of the year from your house and things like that and it's kind of interesting that actually by looking into it in a bit more detail, you actually get sort of some more of the sort of like kind of personality of the bog kind of being expressed by the sort of like very sort of physical properties that, that it has. So kind of this kind of changing um, peaking across the whole of the north of Scotland, for example, the, the surface of the bog peaks in all the centres where the pool systems are, they all peak simultaneously across the whole of the north of scotland all at once <laughs> so it's almost like there's a timing and it kind of to it and then all the the natural margins that are in the flow country all peak at the same time so it's kind of like kind of for what something that you think is kind of this very localized kind of like sort of process actually within a few weeks of each other they're all kind of <laughs> it's all in synchronous it's in synchronicity yes yeah, it's, it's very synchronous <laughs> so okay so um yeah it's kind of it's interesting that kind of that now actually once we start delving into it, it actually has this really interesting link to sort of peatland condition can actually be helped to you to sort of one check how healthy the bog is and then also kind of see how um how it responds to sort of the actions of sort of it's a human activity on it as well so it's kind of it's interesting from that point of view and there's been uh because peatlands have been viewed as waste i guess in the the past mm -hmm. kind of to move from that to something where you're actually using its own features to kind of find out how you can make it better is kind of a quite a nice step change <laughs> yeah. and i think that this idea of like um you know the the relationship to the land and the way that people sort of overlook these um sort of um these processes that it goes through that can in a way relate to us but not in this like form of personification of the land but um bog breathing as a as a concept to me kind of um it seems poetic and abstract but there's this real tangible scientific terms that like kind of underpin it 
and um, which I think is quite interesting as well and it's it's really like measurable it's like you know data oriented stuff but um it, I also like um when I was making my film Profound Divine Sky at the Poor Country there's a um there's a line in one of my poems that talks about people not noticing that the land breathes so and this is without me actually looking at the <laughs> well breathing as a as a concept so when you talked about synchronicity a bit earlier there I thought there's something synchronous about the way that sometimes um you you talk about something that you you kind of feel or or, or have a sense of um by just being somewhere and experiencing it and then it turns out that there is this kind of uh, real tangible reality to it <laughs> Was it the first time that you'd been in a bog or in the flow country when you went up there um, with your projects? Was that kind of the first uh, sort of time that you'd sort of walked through a peatland? I think I remember being a, a teenager and being dragged somewhere by my school and people were, some of my um, my peers were falling in bogs or like accidentally falling in bogs yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I remember that quite vividly but this is the first time that I'd ever made work out in the landscape in the Scottish landscape and um because a lot of my work especially photographic work has been made in studio or in my house and the Divine Sky project was almost exclusively made um in my house uh in my flat in Dundee and in my flat in, in Edinburgh when I moved last uh, those last two years and um yeah, I, I felt this like sense of needing to get out into the landscape, needing to, needing to actually uh, physically access it. But it took two years from the point of wanting to go, <laughs> actually getting to see, to to be there. So I was getting sent pictures by uh, some of your colleagues at RSPB and some people, up in, some friends up in Helmsdale. Um, of the, of the bogs and I was like okay one day I'll get, get there and um, I think I talked about this in my talk um, the other week about how it came I think I've lost uh, <laughs> Sky I don't know I, you've lost me <laughs> Which, whichever I think we've just lost Sakai so we'll give a minute um, Lai looks like she'll probably just be rejoining so everyone just sit tight Chris, while we are waiting for Sakai to join back in, would you be willing to talk a bit more about how you came to this area of study? Um, yeah, so I um, started um, as a geologist. So and um, I did my PhD on um, coal in the Arctic. So completely the opposite end of the <laughs> sort of, I guess, the energy ethics spectrum. <laughs> um, so what happened was that I kind of looked at the paleo environment. Uh, so I was initially working on a project looking at the oil potential of coals in the Arctic. So really uh, <laughs> sort of uh, resource intensive stuff. Um, and as I was working on it, I think I got more interested by the paleo environmental side of things. So looking at how it, what it told us about sort of peatlands in the past, because coal was essentially a peatland. And so um, what um, um, over time, I kind of drifted more to sort of what can coal tell us about peatlands now, and particularly because the Svalbard peatlands formed in the Arctic where we don't get peat forming currently, it kind of tells us about a warmer future. So kind of like, like um, we are sort of like using um, we were using coal as a sort of an environment paleo environmental record a bit like an ice core rather than as a resource so kind of that's where I started the shift over to a more sort of environmental sort of focus and then kind of by chance I um uh the coal industry crashed obviously in pre-2015 for good reason <laughs> and um uh I kind of my research was it wouldn't get funded and then kind of um I got shifted onto onto peatlands and that's well, back. I just had a <laughs> Wi-Fi nightmare. Um, I just got cut off completely, and I had to reconnect. So I'm sorry about that. That's um, fine. <laughs> <laughs> this is the problem with doing things online. <laughs> okay, yeah. sorry. I can't remember where we were in the conversation. Um, so you were just talking about um, how you came to be in uh, the what your first visit to the Flow Country and yeah. how that came to be. Uh, so, so you kind of. You made it up after two years of uh, yeah. sort of waiting, <laughs> waiting. Waiting it was patiently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was amazing, yeah. actually, like from the images, like how <laughs> kind of it looked like you're quite connected with like mm -hmm. the landscape. 
despite it being your first time essentially up here like kind of that seemed to come through quite a lot Mm -hmm. like how did you feel that whilst like was it did you feel that whilst you were here or uh... Mm -hmm. I would say that I kind of build that connection over time like through the research and kind of getting the pictures and the videos and stuff like that from um from people who are up there and just longing it's like that sense of longing to be somewhere and then getting the opportunity to actually visit and um, I was also there with a really amazing team of people who helped to make the film and all of the all of the crew were like really excited to just get out of their houses like we all drove up there together and um, all really you know excited to do like our part to make something really beautiful and um, once we got there the landscape was really stunning and there was that kind of sense of wow like this is so not, not we're not just outside we're seeing something very very particular here so um yeah it felt quite exciting to be there yeah. um do you still get that feeling when you're out there doing your research do you still get kind of a sense of awe yeah I think it's that thing about the landscape of just how large it is and also kind of then you've got that large landscape but then everything is very low so it's kind of a bit of a weird if you've got the small scale mixed with the big vistas sort of thing it's kind of that where you're walking through and like kind of I guess from a looking at um when you're walking through the bog kind of you've got like models uh, particularly with our job like it's kind of you've got models in your head of how things work and there's an intuition that you build up over time of like that should work that should be there should, that shouldn't be there like why is that and then you kind of start spotting all the things that don't match with your sort of like I guess it's your Pete mind palace <laughs> but like yeah. but like kind of it's like kind of you start to like walk through the landscape and you're starting to analyze it and then sort of say like oh this doesn't fit this does fit like kind of why doesn't this fit and it adds more mystery to it because you just kind of know you start to understand what you don't know even more so it's kind of it's that interesting sort of thing where especially with sites you go to frequently it's like kind of you start to be able to navigate them without looking so kind of you'll be in an area that would take hours for someone to walk across because they don't know that you have to jump in this certain place or you have to avoid that bog pool or whatever and then suddenly you you go into autopilot and then it's just you're looking at for the things you haven't noticed before so it becomes really weird so like kind of then it makes some of the experiences more special so like um, one of the sites that I was in RSBV Forsnard is Nockfin Heights which is just behind the, um, and not very many people go there mm-hmm. and then um, we went out um, one with a visitor from Canada and um, then we we came across two adders and I've never come across adders there at all uh, just basking in the sun and it kind of became like this thing where it's kind of like very like suddenly it was like kind of a complete change to what you actually thought was possible in that area and kind of it was kind of that sort of thing where you kind of you're constantly learning from the landscape which I kind of like <laughs> that's kind of how I I like it and sort of that because it's a lot of based on intuition in some respects which is kind of a bit of a scientific dirty word but like kind of <laughs> it's kind of that's uh, that's the bit of science I like is that gray area where you can push the limits in your head yeah. and you might get you might ter- you might terribly get pushed back down to earth once you actually get back in the cold light of day but like kind of it's that kind of spark that landscape can go oh this might be working like this or this that you can test that's kind of like that that's the sort of like uh, thing that kind of and these are all from things that really you can't define massively it's kind of that sort of walk that you can't get without walking through the landscape I guess definitely uh, and I, yeah I think that notion of intuition is really important because obviously for me working as an artist like I, intuition is like a huge aspect of what I do and how I kind of like come about a lot of things that I work with and also working in collaboration with other people as well like kind of heightens that intuitive process because it's not just your own kind of like things that you're noticing but it's all the things that other people are noticing as well and when we were out in the landscape I remember myself and Fiona Catherine Powell who's the seamstress and uh, designer who helped me to make the beautiful dress Blue of the Horizon how the two of us had this like synergy and synchronicity where when we were making the work together before um the dress was made we were having like we would wake up out of dreams and like tell each other like oh I dreamt about this and like and then we would like write it down in our notes and then we would use that to kind of like create elements of the dress and then it then we have this like kind of 
um, uh, this impression that's coming from both of our kind of subconscious minds into this into this uh, one body of work that we made together. And then we take that into the landscape and it becomes almost like a, it's a dreamy kind of looking image as well. So I kind of like the idea that, you know, there's always a hint of the things that um, created something in the final thing. Um, but yeah, I, th I think the idea of the personality of the blog of the bog is really interesting as well, like that you kind of start to understand that particular landscape and how it works and start to be able to navigate it easier as well. Can you speak a little bit about like how you, yeah, the concept of the personality of the bog? I guess this comes from a little bit because I come from an external sort of, because I come from a geology background, there's a lot more filling in gaps in that than potentially from an ecology background in, because you have one core, for example, and you have to extrapolate an entire environment from that. <laughs> so potentially this is very personal to me, but like, I think it's the, like what I find is interesting is that like kind of when you look at the how a peatland starts, for example, so you look at a the section by a riverbank, you can sort of see these little lines of peat kind of and roots and uh, kind of maybe some trees that have fallen over or something like that and the 6,000 years old or something. And it's a, like almost like this kind of thing of like how much they, the peatland kind of has to try to get started like there's these like sort of repeated failed attempts essentially <laughs> until it finally gets to the stage where actually it can sustain itself and once it's at that stage it takes off and it kind of like and it kind of you can look through the sort of the the layers of the peat and almost see this kind of history and like what is experienced and the time when it dried out and trees start to expand onto its surface and kind of like all these little things that kind of tell you about how it responded to some external sort of factor that kind of it had no control over itself which obviously is personifying it a little bit but like kind of I'm, but it's kind of it's 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 kind of going through and as well then starting to think of the other side of things so what actually will kind of like when it hasn't when it has started to fail like kind of whether it be not by natural or man-made sort of activity kind of like how does that work so kind of like what ultimately does kill off a peat bog how long can one exist like kind of what happens when it's starting to sort of degrade kind of all those sort of questions of like sort of which kind of if you're applying them to a person it kind of it almost is very simple similar in some respects so that's kind of gives it that personality and like also where it surprises you as well so kind of you walk it like when I was talking about like where you walk through the landscape and then suddenly there's a plant that has is in a place that has it it has no right to be <laughs> or kind of the sort of um where you suddenly see like where um by chance something has um happened so once when we were walking through um we were working on a bog in Dumfries and Galloway where a bog had started on top of a boulder field so there were massive holes underneath it so it should have drained itself <laughs> but somehow it had managed to cling on in this very sort of substandard <laughs> location and get sort of one and a half meters deep so it's kind of like kind of this is i think it's one of those landscapes where kind of on the surface it looks all the same but then once you start looking in detail it's really like kind of you get like little rewards in terms of like kind of sort of just these things it's kind of all about being on the ground and sort of seeing it and hearing it and smelling it and like kind of I mean there are some negatives like with the the clouds of midges in the middle of summer <laughs> and things like that but like kind of it's there are it's it is like kind of being in that landscape is kind of just I, I find it really inspirational in trying to kind of think of how does this work like kind of and it doesn't take any of the magic away from that landscape yeah. It just adds to it in some respects, which I think is quite nice. <laughs> I, I think actually I experienced a little bit of that in, on Sky like last year with the midges. It felt like it, I was visiting the um, the fairy pools and there were so many midges, like we were absolutely mauled. But there was some kind of like reward in being able to like kind of get through that horrible experience, <laughs> you know, yeah to get to the water and to to be able to feel that water and to and to understand that like yeah there's like so, almost like a there's a there's a, a what's the word like a toll that you have to pay and yeah. then that sort of brings you back to that really folkloric idea of like the fae folk having kind of like boundaries and you know um and I was I was thinking a lot about um folklore in relation to our conversation as well because you talked a little bit about the will of the wisp and um 
And I, I was thinking about that in terms of uh, um, what's the scientific explanation, which you told me before, because I thought that was quite an interesting yes. thing. Yeah, so the uh, will o' the wisp is kind of suppose is is related to the gases that are released by the the bog. So they kind of have a translucent sort of look when they so they kind of reflect the moonlight. And so people attributed them to kind of this uh, paranormal sort of uh, being. <laughs> but actually, it's just it's essentially just the the release of gases on the bog. I mean, I think it's interesting as well because like looking at your the the um, the stills from your video, it's kind of as well like kind of that sort of how you can attribute kind of quite ritual type sort of images yeah. and sort of into that landscape so and it was amazing how you brought like the indigo which and the dress which is kind of I guess quite personal to you and also culturally personal into a into a kind of different landscape and how that kind of melded quite well within that that landscape and and what one of the things I noticed was almost the blue of the indigo. I hadn't seen that blue in, which is a weird thing to kind of look at. But like that blue <laughs> within the landscape, <laughs> it's kind of a different blue, but it's almost as if it was missing from okay. that landscape, which is kind of, I thought was quite interesting. It was like kind of because I was thinking like, oh, it's not really in the sky, and the pools are black, and it's kind of, and it, how that responded to the different sort of day and night cycles and things like that was quite an interesting sort of how you brought your own take into the flow country which is kind of interesting yeah and I think that like that kind of um when you kind of bring something else to a place and then hope that it responds in the way that you'd like and I think um it does go back to the intuitive process because I had no idea whether what I was bringing was going to actually have any sort of effect on the landscape at all but like you say, like some as someone who's been in that landscape many, many, many times, you could, you're able to notice that something, something new has been has been positioned here, and um, yeah. And I, I was thinking about that in relation to like the the re representation of, of black bodies within the landscape as well, because that's something that I was thinking a lot about with this project and with like a lot of the projects I'm working on at the moment. It's this idea of um, black people and other like marginalized folks who um live in different like you know intersections of different multiple uh, identities might find it difficult to find their way into those landscapes to access them to feel welcome and to feel encouraged to explore there so i wanted these images to kind of be another way to, a way in not just to a conversation around the the landscape itself a conversation around the conservation project but also about who belongs to and within that landscape so um yeah that's kind of like a lot of the things that I've been thinking about as well and um yeah and I want to do more <laughs> more yeah. more bringing of people and and colors and ideas into the space because I think as well it's like kind of until you bring a new a new perspective into the landscape I think that you will only see it through kind of a tunnel vision and like kind of my my sort of segue from geology into sort of the into peatlands and then the flow country kind of gives me a kind of different perspective potentially on it than other people who come from a different background but like essentially like kind of if you don't if you don't get people in there in the first place you don't get those perspectives and you can't move things on and you can't push the limits of what you know about that landscape or what that landscape means to you as well which I think is really important because it's kind of that sort of <clears throat> sort of if you can't diversify view, the views that you that kind of something has it becomes quite staid mm -hmm. and sort of like it has so it, it's, it's really uh, it was, I just found it very interesting that like, kind of like how you brought your sort of uh, personal sort of um, connection with you almost into the landscape and then that kind of almost made you connect with the landscape more <laughs> in some respects <laughs> and that that whole idea of like um talking to the bog like speaking to that um space as well that kind of I felt like that was happening quite a lot in the process of making the film we were having so many strange things <laughs> happening <laughs> like while we're filming like the the bog was kind of almost like um it felt like it was alive it felt like there was this like kind of mist of like really um 
this intense amount of moisture around us and there was like the sun was really hot for those three days so like uh, the pools are like black so they were like really absorbing that heat so it was really warm and the dress was completely soaked <laughs> as well and then um, and at night like just as we were like filming the last couple of scenes the har started to kind of like come in in the background and I felt like that was like I, I was asking the blogger question and then it was kind of answering um and recently I've been working with um, the concept of call and response in another project. And I just thought a lot about that idea of like speaking to the bog and having it respond. Um, and having already kind of experienced this like strange phenomenon in, in the making of the Found Divine Sky film, I'm kind of like, right, okay, I want to, I want to keep doing that. I want to keep exploring more spaces like this. Like how can we kind of, in all the different ways, whether it's scientific or within the arts, like kind of start speaking more to these like non-human um, uh, actors, of, like the land and and everything like that. Yeah, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, because I I mean it's the same as when we're like I think going back to what you said about kind of almost like having to pay sort of a a price or like a sort of like a like a toll towards like kind of being in the landscape almost of like kind of where it's it's almost I guess it's a bit Nietzschean like a bit like where you kind of sort of it's the things where you've striven to get to the to force through so so in your case like kind of having to wait two years kind of all that like anticipation and like in our case usually it's uh like every single weather that Scotland can <laughs> throw at us mixed with midges and horse flies uh, and, and long walks and things. And then you get just that one moment where you kind of like it quietens down and you get like this sort of this either silence or kind of just the sort of like sounds of nature around you and stuff like that. And it kind of gives you that sort of like little reward that then is much greater than the one because you put effort into it. <laughs> it kind of gives you that sort of like it just becomes much more meaningful it's not like a it, and is they're the moments you always remember at the times when it was torrential rain uh <laughs> and just that moment where you ended up in the eye of the storm or whatever and you kind of so it's it's really interesting that kind of you got that as well like yeah. like through sort of walking through sort of the flow country which kind of is kind of not one of those places that people really go out into the bog very often so it's kind of interesting to sort of once you are in it, it becomes it's very eerie, almost straight af- off the path, <laughs> sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but one of the things I was going to ask, just from a practical point of view, with the dress, like how did that? Uh, you said it got wet. <laughs> yeah. it, how did it? Did it cope with the bog pools and the the sphagnum and things? And did that actually help, like the connection with the sort of flow country, or did it hinder it? <laughs> Well, we were like very prepared, very prepared after all that waiting. Um, so I'd been talking to um, some of your colleagues at like RSPV and saying, so where can I physically stand and walk and manoeuvre this, uh, this landscape? And the, I was asked, I was told to, um, to go to the, the observation tower and we did a quick, you can see in the film, there's like actually a few shots where the observation tower is actually there. And we were able to drag all of our equipment and then drop it off in there and then do the filming. And there's a path, a really nice, <laughs> well laid out path that I was able to walk on. So I've, there was a very limited amount of time where my wellies were having to actually go into the, yeah. the uh, bog itself. But I know that there was times when myself and uh, some of the people in the crew, like my friend Sersha and East was like running around so, like crazy. And I kept on being like, so sure you're going to fall into the bog at some point could you please <laughs> just chill <laughs> she was so excited and I think that there's that thing of it, it is really exciting being out there and you kind of get carried away and I know how easily any of us could have just dropped into it or we could drop some equipment um but yeah I think that that preparation beforehand and knowing where to go and kind of kind of scoping it out really and making sure that we didn't we didn't have the drone fall into the, the bog pools or anything like that um was kind of important as well yeah yeah 
yeah. <laughs> it's an issue we have as well so kind of <laughs> we like kind of where where the drone will land and things like that and kind of um which green to avoid <laughs> <laughs> and things like that uh, i think as well you start to adapt to the bog as you walk across it so you kind of adapt your gait so the more it becomes almost like a we call it like bog legs a bit like sort of sea legs where you kind of almost have to adopt a shambolic walking <laughs> style to get across it and they essentially you just do lunges and uh, <laughs> yeah. sort of leg raises for the entire day whilst you're out on the bog so it's kind of it's one of those things where kind of um everything when you're working out there becomes about how to kind of fit around the bog not the other way around so it's kind of like you might you have to go out with the sort of intention and I guess it's the same as when you were there luckily you were kind of lucky with the weather mm -hmm. but it's almost like you go out there not knowing what you will get so you have to kind of say it's almost prioritizing that into must-haves might get <laughs> the perfect day will produce sort of things and like kind of I remember when we were working on a project um with uh, it, where um, we were working on uh, looking at surveying on a bog and there was the two of us. Uh, so um, at one time it was uh, Henk Peter Sturk who was uh, at the uh, ERI um, and uh, Peter Gilbert. And we essentially, our entire language went to three words because that's all we could get across the, the with the wind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so it, essentially we, were, we went to ready um reset if something went wrong and done and yeah. that's all we said to each other all day <laughs> because that kind of that was the most efficient way of getting things this cross and anything else wouldn't be carried by the wind and it was like kind of like so we kind of pretty much we were already sort of like aching in the really weird muscles from having to get across the bog and things like that but then also we are we we reduced our entire life experience into three three words sometimes that, that we had to do once once or twice a month for like yeah. a few years. <laughs> well, that's kind of funny though because it re reminds me of having to just shout like for for props <laughs> from a distance like this <laughs> and then someone <laughs> running across the base and like it was genuinely like that at times just because we were like it was kind of waiting for when the drone was gonna like start um coming down and like trying to make sure that everybody was positioned in a way that it wouldn't hit them or there was like a lot of navigating the, the landscape but also navigating the equipment and um but yeah and I feel I feel kind of as if um I don't know how we managed to but we I don't think we checked the weather we just got the weather so yeah. I think that's the great thing about it that Scotland is um generous like that sometimes <laughs> Um, and there wasn't even any days when I felt like it was like really really bad there was a one rainy day when we but we weren't on the actual um peatlands on that day and you can kind of see it in the in the film that's a bit more muggy um but on that day it was like kind of get the shots done get under our umbrella like you know and I think I think sometimes when you're doing something that has a time limit and in and you're trying to get as much done as physically possible in a, in a short period of time. It might be a bit different than when you're trying to collect data. Do you do you spend quite a long time in the bogs? Like, do you spend it? Yeah. So it depends on what we're doing. So kind of, um, and depends on like different approaches. So kind of, we're quite lucky in the in, because we're in Thurso. Like a lot of our field sites are actually within car different distance so mm -hmm. if it's a bad day we can kind of adapt whereas people who are coming up to do research or so coming from abroad they have those one day like they, they have to get things done in that five day period or seven day period or whatever whereas we can adapt a little bit more um but what that means it means is we generally just collect more data because <laughs> we can go back the next day and the next day and sort of I think it's kind of as well because the weather forecasts aren't great up here that you kind of um, start using these sort of like kind of rules of thumb that kind of aren't based in any form of science. So I remember when we were working on some field sites, it would be that if you saw a cloud coming over the Ben Grahams, which are in the background of where you were, that kind of you knew that you were in for a, a rainstorm in about 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and it was those sort of things like kind of to do with like, oh, that mountain looks misty we better start going down or I mean we still got caught out with occasional thunderstorms where we were surrounded by lightning and we were in the sun in the middle and stuff like that and it's kind of and all um funnel clouds as well <laughs> we've had in the low country but like it's kind of one of those things that you kind of would miss like no one else is in that landscape so it's kind of 
you have that almost like this sort of because there's so few people around that you kind of it feels like it's special to you because you kind of it's unlikely that someone's walked on that spot <laughs> in any amount of time and kind of it's, it feels like it has that more exploration sort of vibe I guess than that you do, it's really hard to get in the UK now mm. like it's kind of that connection to somewhat wildness even though obviously it's a human landscape but like it's it's interesting from that point of view um there's like a sense of vastness there like that I hadn't experienced really for like a really long time it was quite nice to not just having come out of my house after a two-year (laughs) stint but also just in general like I don't think I'd ever experienced that in Scotland before yeah it has like those sort of like kind of a framed view and like I always think it's like almost like a glacial landscape as well it feels like kind of you've just walked out straight after the, the sort of the glaciers have just melted and you've kind of just gone out onto it and it's kind of because I guess it's that lack of trees as well which kind of is other than the ones that were planted in, like <laughs> planted but like kind of that have been restored uh, now but like kind of it's that sort of yeah just getting those vistas across across and just being able to see for 20 30 40 miles and if you just bog as far as the eye can see and like the glint of the bog pools just kind of shimmering on a nice day and stuff like that it's kind of it's quite magical from like that point of view so um but yeah it's, 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 it's it is so cool. beautiful and that's and that's why I chose that landscape for the for the film because I wanted to have that reflection you know of the the sky and the pools and just it felt like a really um a very unique and particular type of landscape that needed to have I think the you know the full country website gives it a very <laughs> very beautiful image anyway but I kind of felt like I wanted to capture some of that myself as well um, I think you can't capture as well it's very hard to capture the essence of like some of those like for example like the fact that you had the dusk view like kind of it's even rare for us to kind of get out at that time like uh, we have some PhD students that do all night sampling so they they, they sample gases in peat pools um, overnight um, and kind of they see that but mm. it's kind of like it's a very rare view of the flow country because usually everybody's gone at like kind of at dusk and mm. it's kind of a very different landscape at night from from the day as well it's kind of very like the colours are completely different and they just the ambience of everything is so different. Um, just with that different light. <laughs> it's 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 really uh, uh yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> I'm so sorry to interrupt you guys, but I think if it's okay, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the QA portion. And um so everybody watching, please feel free to drop some questions into the QA and we can go through them. But uh to start off, Sakai, so how how did like this first experience shooting in nature, because before, as you said before, you were really working in the studio, how has it impacted the work that you've made since? Do you have plans to kind of shoot more in the future in nature now that you've done it once? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think it's something I really want to do more of. Um, obviously living in Scotland, it's like some of the most beautiful places in the world and it's not hard to come by, you know, uh, locations to to do some shoots and do some filming and but um, I'm kind of concentrating a lot at the moment in site specific and on-site projects so some some that involve like working within buildings the spaces as well as outside so um it, it has broadened my my practice and scope of my practice quite a lot and I was uh I mean shooting in a building is so different from shooting in nature have you how have you kind of adapted to those two different challenges that I would assume that they present I think it's actually about kind of taking different things from from both like so I I would say like some of the places that I've been working in it's actually about looking at what people have already placed within this particular building like what is um significant about the architecture what is significant about the interiors um the, the um the choices of 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 um materials the kind of um the history of it and all that kind of stuff so that kind of comes up quite a lot whereas when you're in the landscape you're looking at nature so it's such a you know there's so many different things you can you can look at and cling to but it's really about how the um how the, the weather is adapting like we were talking about there and like how the uh, what um animals and uh, what kind of uh, plant life is there and like the ecosystems and how they kind of like are um how they function together and everything like that whereas in a building you're 
it's all placed by humans and so very <laughs> strategic. So it's a, it's a completely different thing. Um, but you 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 work in in different ways with both. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like um, almost in both cases, like Chris said, it's sort of bending to the thing and sort of work. Yeah, working with what you have there, um, Chris. So, what is sort of like the carbon absorption power of the peatlands, and how you know, in this kind of broader conversation of the climate crisis, what does it mean to rely on these peat bogs in the face of that? So, in terms of sort of carbon sequestration, peat bogs taking carbon very slowly over time so they build up over thousands and thousands of years so they are a net sort of sink of co2 but a very small one over on an annual basis so kind of they're never going to kind of grow their way us out of any of the climate crisis but what um in from a scottish and a global perspective is the big problem is that kind of when you degrade a carbon bog a car, a peat, peat bog they become a massive source of carbon. So kind of when you, uh, if you take Scotland as an example, kind of um, 80% of the peatlands in Scotland are in bad condition. So they're a net source of CO2. So if you actually look at losing that 80% over, you essentially end up with hundreds of years of Scotland's emissions that could be kind of, that, that um, if you lost all that, you'd kind of, it wipes out all the good work that we have from kind of reducing our sort of like move the moving to electric cars or kind of uh, making things more efficient or more efficient appliances. So it's kind of that thing of the avoided losses are the important thing with uh, peatlands more than the sort of sequestration side of things. So it's kind of by stopping them doing, uh, by stopping them releasing carbon, we can essentially stop a major source of sort of land-based carbon getting into the atmosphere and kind of wiping out all the good things that people are trying to do with. So it's kind of never going to be a sequestration thing, or it is if you're looking over thousands of years, but I don't think people are. (laughs) But it's more about that avoided loss. So it's kind of saying like, we've got this big carbon reservoir, we don't want to lose that because that's going to, even if we do everything right from now on, that will wipe, wipe out all the gains that we've got. And I think if we, that's the kind of importance of the landscape is it's like almost this, if we treat it well, it will be locked in for a long, lot longer and you'll get a net positive, a very small net positive kind of reduction in the CO2, uh, in carbon equivalent. But if you let it go to waste or if you mistreat it, essentially it's a time bomb that you can't, you're not, we're not going to be able to recover from. And I think that's kind of the sort of with peatland restoration that's kind of the main driver is to avoid those emissions so that we can kind of when we make progress in some other area it's not wiped out by the land-based emissions um yeah yeah. wow um so we have a question from the audience um so Anne is asking both of you spoke about bog breathing and i was wondering whether you know of any breathing groups that aim to breathe together with the bog um sort of and then she clarifies saying um, what she means is breathing with the bog as a way of engaging directly and um, differently with a more than kind of human entity. Um, I haven't um, sort of, because bog breathing is kind of up until recently hasn't really been kind of well known. I guess it's kind of um, at an early stage of how people engage with that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think kind of, obviously in terms of the actual physical way of breathing with the bog like that like it's it's kind of a seasonal thing so it's kind of but I think by using that as a sort of metaphor to kind of engage with the bog I think that's quite a good way of working with sort of the peatland environment Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah I haven't heard of anything yeah I think from an artistic perspective that's something that could be quite a nice opening kind of brief for um, a group of artists to consider Mm -hmm. because there's something about like um doing something at a particular time together you know and uh, yeah so it's got me thinking as well (laughs) notes thank you very much Anne (laughs) I'll credit you (laughs) 